Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Richard Strange, uh, of course, a complete relation, but um, I want to talk about something a little bit different today, something I talked about at the Worldwide Conference last month, actually. And I can see we've got John Giles in the um, uh, in attendance today, so he'll probably be able to answer some of these questions better than even I can, but this is a, a area of passion for him as well. But yeah, my what I've seen is you tend to get some people that are very, very passionate about ontologies and they'll go deeply into all sorts of tools and expensive vendor solutions. And then it all falls to pieces because they're not ready. They haven't really tried it out. Uh, there isn't very much buy-in. So what I want to talk about today really is how to do it for free, how to do it very easily. All you need is um, sticky notes, a whiteboard, um, a pen, a phone camera and maybe a cricket bat and I'll come to that later but yes so this is me um, sadly I'm not the Sorcerer Supreme um, I do all sorts of other things uh, I've now left AgriCompass but I was the CTO there I was the keynote for last year's uh, Worldwide Data Vault Consortium conference and I do all sorts of things from working as a data modeler as data consultant through to AI work that includes volcanic work or uh, a lot of climate work now, the easy answer and the simple answer for how to effectively refactor your data vault is just talk to your business users. That's a very, very, very simple answer. And that gives us about 59 minutes for questions. Well, if, if you want a bit more then really what I'll cover is understanding and defining ontologies. I know it's a little bit tautological to talk about definitions in ontologies, but it's important. Um, we'll then look at how to run a couple of semantic workshops, how we can use that to refactor source system data vaults in quite a painless way, and then a little bit on the end for semantic led data science and sort of next steps. Now, I know a lot of you will look at this and go, ontologies, don't talk to me about ontologies. You know, it, it's very much a Marvin moment. This is the later one. Both versions will crop up if you're familiar with the old BBC one. It makes a lot of people retract into their shell and hide. Well, the thing is, is that ontologies are more than just things to use within governance applications. Now in this talk, I've got a lot to cover in limited time, so I'm going to dip into a few things rather than go very deeply into the concepts. And there are other people out there that will be able to take a much better mature take on ontologies and will be able to explain them much better than I can. Now, defining ontologies. Yes, like I've warned already, there's going to be a lot of definitions here. I'll try and keep them light and easy. But, you know, the the deepest one really is it comes from Greek, you know, this idea of being existence and the idea of rational account and knowledge. You can call them analytical metaphysics, but we won't bother with that. If you see that, they basically mean the same thing. Now, the ones that everyone here should be familiar with are taxonomies. They're nice and they're easy. We talk about things like leaves, roots, nodes. These are ontologies, but they're only a particular kind. Each line here, each um, edge is what's called an is a. So a duck is a bird, a penguin is a flightless bird and is a bird, they inherit. This is quite nice and easy because this is like most class systems whenever you're writing in, well, the vast majority of object-oriented programming concepts. Great, so if I understand object-oriented programming, do I understand ontologies? Uh, yes and no. Yes, you can use Liskov and things like that to understand if your taxonomy makes sense, but there's more to it than that. And this is where we start to split away from or start to home in on where things go wrong in implementing ontologies. So the first thing that defines good domain ontologies rather than big universal ones is the fact that they're scoped. So here we might be talking about road vehicles. Now, if we are zooming in too much not thinking about it well a, a train should be greater than a four-wheeled vehicle but it's not a road vehicle there's a very strict definition to scope here and if you don't scope you don't have a good ontology and this is the other issue even here we're still going back to is a every single time there's a clear inheritance now that's great when we're trying to model data and great when we're trying to write some code but there's many many other relationships this is a drop in the ocean. The thing is, you look at all of these and you see them drawn out on a whiteboard and you go, yeah, well, 
I can probably abstract that up to make them a taxonomy, which will help with my data model. It will help with my code. It will help with whatever I'm doing. And that's great, except for the fact that every time you do that, you lose business information. It's a bit like integration differentiation. You've always got that plus K unknown at the end, which you'll never be able to get back once you remove it. So to give you an example, this is a genuine small section of an ontology looking at clinical trial reviews. Now, loads and loads of these are non-inherited. Uh, They're non-is-a. Now, if you try and boil this down simply, you can go, well, you know, an institutional review, board chairperson, an ethicist, and an investigator and a human subject, they're all people. Maybe we should model them in party. I mean, not that we should, but maybe we'll put them all together as just people, as contacts. Fine, that's okay for a simple data model, but they're totally different parts of the business with totally different roles and relationships. The moment you abstract that away, suddenly you've lost that huge amount of information about what's actually happening in the business. Now, this is a user view ontology. We're not talking about you should build any data model to follow all of this step by step by step. That's not what we're here for today. But when you want to start building these, the few things we try and stick to is things should be real. Entities should be real in some way or another, even if they're a bit abstract. OK, they can't just be some weird collection name. You really should scope whatever you're doing as strictly as possible. It makes your life a lot easier. And then if you need to, you branch out bit by bit by bit and test your ontology as you bring more concepts in. Accept that your ontology is going to be wrong and it's going to change. Now, ontologies are pretty good at change. If I was to draw an ontology of how the universe or the solar system, rather, worked maybe in the 1500s, I would still have most of the planets. I'd have the sun, I'd have the moon, I'd have the earth. But the lines between them would be different to, say, after Copernicus started writing about the idea of a heliocentric solar system. Suddenly, the, the nodes are there. It's just the lines inversed. It's very, very easy to change, and it's okay if it changes. Now, generally, when you're looking to do this, and I'll dip a bit more into how to do this later, scope is the most important thing. It's also useful to be able to step away when you're very new to this and find some documentation. Job descriptions are a great place to start. Um, go through, trawl through, and pick out maybe about 50 to 60 core terms. Try and define them a little bit. Those are going to be your entities. You can order them into a hierarchy. That helps you with your data modeling later. And try and make sure there's some sort of readability and logical coherence. Again, pinch of salt, because a lot of the business documentation out there isn't necessarily up to date either. Job descriptions are good because you could, they have a date on them, they have an expiry on them. General naming rules, we'll try and follow these a little bit. These aren't crucial, just entities are singular nouns. If they're common, you like to use italics. Try not to use uh, mass nouns. You can start looking at serial identifiers. That goes more into business glossaries. Uh, and whatever you do, don't overload your meaning. Two words should never, one word should never mean two things. Now, trying to get all of that horrible definition stuff out of the way, this is where things get a bit more interesting. So I'm going to talk about volcanoes. It's something I know well enough to be able to give you a business view on. Or rather, this is a, a, I suppose, public sector view on rather than private enterprise. Now, to follow those steps, I've taken out a, a number of papers, reports, white papers, and I've trawled through them, things just like this one, and picked out a number of entities, not 50, that's a bit much to cover today, but there's about 21 or so here. And they look at some of these and go, yes, Richard, but some of these are processes, things like data processing, data acquisition. I know we'll come back to that in a moment. But what you do is you throw them up, and I'm sure John will go, I recognize this, this is his approach. You can throw them up and have a look at them. You can start to draw lines between them. And that's all very good and well. But going back to my first slide, you need to talk to your users. So all you need to do is take all these entities, write them up on sticky notes on a whiteboard and have a number of whiteboard pens. The bat is there to encourage your users. If they don't turn up to the first meeting, they will turn up to the second. And you simply scatter it around and tell them, start drawing lines. Try and encourage them to start drawing about bits they're familiar with 
and eventually they might take only a, a number of stickies but they'll start to draw these little relationships these little webs they'll leave out, out the parts they're not familiar with you repeat that five six ten times with different key users of the business and eventually you'll be able to after taking a photograph of each of them manually put together a kind of diagram a bit like this now this is a bit messy we have a better way to do this but already we can start to see patterns things like the fact that data streams actually a very unconnected process to a lot of the rest of the business but it seems to be that observatories are highly connected to a lot of other parts maybe that's something we need to look at in our data model and we can also step back and organize these logically like we talked about a couple of slides ago well here we can see there's about four or five core categories and we can pull this out and start to use that to build a very simple data model now processes always behave differently we'll put those off to one side for now we want to capture metrics about those later so we end up with something like this we know that we've got some kind of locator we know that volcanoes uh, observatories sites things like that are going to be very important we have this concept of party we're using party here just to keep it simple there are better ways to do this if you've got a much bigger system this is purely for the sake of simplicity we have events documents because it's not the decision or uh, that we can record it's the um, business artifacts from a decision or archival records or the hazard maps we produce to help decide if when an eruption begins what needs to be evacuated what can be left and at what stage and lastly we put algorithms out to one side because they behave a little bit differently now what I'm going to do from here on out is use, there's a number of tools out there. I've just picked the first one I could use quickly. This one is um, YWorks. They have a number of paid and free graphing solutions. And I just start pulling in shapes and drawing lines. They can also configure themselves to look nice and neat. And we'll be using that functionality from here on out. So I throw that in. Nice and simple, same diagram we've seen before, if not a little bit tidier. We can see the more interconnected, the more it tends to weigh it out to the top left. But this isn't the most useful of diagrams. We can use things. These are organic grams. Now, these have some kind of soft spatial variation. So you could say that uh, data processing down at the bottom has more to do with archival and auto detection algorithms than it is to do with unrest in the top right corner. And the checklist has more to do with an alarm than it does a civil defense authority. But where it gets far more interesting, this is perhaps the best or the key slide for the entire talk, is when you start creating some kind of grouping on that circular diagram we saw before. Now, this is very simple. This isn't any particular complex clustering. All this diagram is trying to do is minimize the length of the lines that connect each node to another node. There's no machine learning involved here, nothing like that. Yet already we're starting to see these weird groupings and these groupings have semantic value and I'll prove that in a moment. And if you want to replicate it, you just need to make sure that your node distance setting is set to zero. So you encourage it to be as tight as possible and that you allow the edges to be bundled. That's all it takes. So let's have a look at this bottom one. So this is risk communication, a decision, and a hazard risk map. Now we know the decision is really going to be a decision record. But risk communication in its own right, well, it isn't an entity, it's a process. We know that risk communication is where a party, we go away and talk to the business, they'll tell us, well, it's a party making a decision on an event. So we start to tie these together and what we start to find is whether it's with a hazard map or without a hazard map, these start to become units of work, things that are very, very hard to start picking out unless you're a very comfortable and very experienced data modeler with a good business analyst. But we've just been able to prove this from first principles just by the fact that enough people have drawn lines between a collection of the three. And where the three are connected to other things, they tend to do it in triplicate. So we're already starting to be able to pull out structure and architecture just from 
drawing shapes and taking photos. Now it goes even further because if we have a look at this coupling here, now even I, when I was putting together this, didn't really, it wasn't obvious to me that these two would link together. It wasn't obvious that it wouldn't, it just never occurred to me. But these auto detection algorithms, these things that sit and they listen to earthquakes uh, rumbling away just under the surface of a volcano, and they'll trigger and send off alarms and send off some analysis when something starts to happen, actually behave in many ways similar to a volcanologist. So we can start asking questions about whether we can compare the performance between the two. There's all sorts of metrics we can start to ask about, and although these won't have a huge link apart from one where a volcanologist may help adapt an algorithm, they actually allow us to start exploring exploration links. So we can start to understand where we can ask the very interesting BI questions, just because these two things, which are not like each other, are very closely coupled. Well, this goes into refactoring your sort of source system data faults. Now we're going through these, we're seeing these patterns. And I know you, you land in a source system data vault, you look at the previous work and you go, oh God, I ought to know I'm feeling quite depressed or very depressed, which is uh, another Marvin quote. But generally, I think everyone here, most people here are familiar with them. It's where usually an in-house team, but not always, um, have some superficial understanding of what data vault is, but they don't fully understand it. What they end up doing is rather than talking to the users especially, they will simply look at the source system and use that to base their architecture. They tend to one-to-one -one map if they have a hub for every source system table they have. There's very little semantic meaning in there and the integration with the rest of the data vault system tends to fall to pieces. So it isn't, doesn't really follow the business any closer than the, than the original legacy system did and it doesn't follow Data Vault 2.0. So you've got the worst of both worlds. There's no greater alignment here. But on the plus side, at least you have a landing area. You'll have to refactor it at some point down the line, but at least you've got your, your data in. That's the that's step one. From there on out, refactoring here is again going through these workshops. You need to find your business users and find those entities go through job descriptions, go through white papers, anything you can find. If they have existing glossaries, fantastic. Don't go above 50 entities to begin with, it's too much. It's too complex, you won't get the level of granularity you need to start with. The focus and effort will be spread too thin through your interviews and yourself. Then run your semantic workshops, run them with a user at a time for half an hour. Let them lead, don't draw, let them draw. Prod them a bit if you have to, and just photograph. At the end, you may also want to bring them back, depending upon the dynamics, as a group and get them to sense check other people's connections. You're able to then put those together and plot. Yes, you'll put in your, uh, you'll start to build your core structures, your hubs, your links, your satellites, some of your units of work. But first, what's quite useful is, and this comes with a caveat, find that first exploration link that looks especially interesting. If you've got a firefight and you've got a priority to start delivering some standard reports straight away, ignore this, focus on those first. But failing that, find that first interesting question, then take a step back and you want to backfill upstream this standard right to left pattern. Identify that exploration links, what reports that would create. Go back, understand what hubs, links and satellites need to be in place to allow that, that report to happen. Go back to staging, make sure it's staged well, go back to your landing and populate forward just for that thin, narrow, lateral slice. And then once that's delivered, you can hand that over to BI. They start to look at it. You start to get analytical value very, very early on. And you go back and look at your next exploration link to hopefully one that's adjacent. The idea is at that point, it becomes like a standard agile pattern, right to left build data vault, where you incrementally build and test your architecture as you go. Then once that's done, you go back to your semantic workshops, add in additional entities that you, that you cut off for going past 50 do a bit more whiteboarding. When you run out of those, go back, find a different business area that you'd scoped out. 
do more entity mining. It's a constant cycle. This isn't the only way to do it, but it's one that deliberately focuses on getting BI, very interesting BI results out very quickly. Now, there are a number of patterns for refactoring that are helpful here. The strangler pattern uh, is effectively where you allow the legacy system, if you're replacing reports already, to exist up until the point where you've got a new mart or a new report ready to go and then you just alias it out overnight. Uh, it's a bit like uh, Strangler Ivy, it wraps itself around a tree and eventually the tree dies, but it uses it as its own anchor to grow from. Again, right to left development here is incredibly helpful and reconciliation testing is also useful, making sure that whatever reports you're producing on the app um, for your new model, that it matches anything that you've got in your old reports. Again, if we're diving into this too much, we'd have two, three hours to cover this properly. But the last and pretty important one here is, again, we have the semantic diagram. You can check when you've built the data model and go, does this make sense? You can not only go back to the source system and go back to some of your interviews, you can go back to that semantic diagram you've constructed. Go, are these close together? Does this make sense? Are there links here? Now, the last bit I'd like to cover is sort of a bit of data science and a bit of beyond data science, working with semantic um, networks. So most of the analysis we're looking for, really the value of it is, right, well, is the reason that we find BI to be so useful is it tends to find relationships that our data model has missed. It's one thing to just produce a nice monolithic um report out at the end and that's fine for a lot of standard reporting a lot of financial data but where bi has its most value is where you find unexpected connections between two parts of your model two parts of your architecture so is it that you've truncated important business information when you've been building these are there connections that just never cropped up in your modeling either way having a semantic link or a semantic network to base yourself off of is fantastic. Normally what happens when you see data scientists at work is the business will go to a BI team with an embedded data scientist or data science group. They'll ask a question and then they'll try and define it, get some requirements. Data engineer will go away and he'll create an exploration link and create a mart. That will be provided to the data scientist. He'll have a play with the data and he'll try a very simple exploratory model. And this model may not perform very well, but that's okay. You know, that means maybe there's extra gains to be given here. Maybe there's something we're missing. And a simple standard model may not perform very well. So they go away for another three, four weeks and they churn and churn and churn and spend lots of compute time. And they have this amazing model at the end. Fantastic, only sometimes all they find at the end of it is there's no significant relationship to be found. That's three, four, six, eight weeks lost. If only there was some way of knowing the relationships of two entities ahead of time. Well, yeah, ontologies are for cheaters. We can find these ahead of time. We don't create the exploration links on a hunch or a standard business question. We create them because we know there's an entity relationship between them. There's a semantic relationship between them already. We're cheating. But there's a few extra things I want to fit in just in the time that we've got today. There's causal inference, um, graph machine learning, and vectorization work that also fit very closely to some of this. Now, for graph ML work, the reason why it's quite hard to do is because you need to typically map a very centralized interlinked core data model out to something that is very, very different. It's all based on these particular relationships. There are some fits, there are some lack of fits between data vault and this, but if you've got a semantic diagram, a semantic model backing up your data vault, suddenly it's much easier. You have this blueprint. Normally the big killer for these projects when you're looking to create these graph marts is the fact you need to go back and construct these diagrams. If you've been using this as the basis for a lot of your design, especially your refactoring, it's there already. There's 
uh, really a lot of the work's been done up front. This is also very, very important when you start to get bigger and bigger and more complex data and more complex joints. Graph databases aren't that more performant. In fact, they're a little bit less performant for very simple queries. Once you go beyond about five or six joins deep, or even about four really, their performance becomes better and better and better on average compared to everything else. Not to mention, you can start to vectorize your database. And some of the interesting queries there, well, this is a lot of how uh, Spotify's recommendations work. This is how a lot of um, Uber Eats food recommendations work. A lot of these systems are based upon identifying similarities within um, entities in these graphs. And there's a lot of very interesting questions. I mean, graph ML fully as its own question is too much to cover today. But even just vectorization on the text that you have is an interesting question itself. So we've started by manually pulling out entities from our business documentation. Well, there's nothing to stop us from doing a textual analysis of all of that and start to create our own vectorization. By vectorization, I mean that you look at the adjacency. So whether one word's next to another one, whether it shares the sentence with it, a paragraph or a page, or it never appears together, or it appears together with a, with a, a negating term such as not or no. Now there's loads of those out there. A lot of them are based on Wikipedia and they give a lovely standard for um, the English language. And what they do is they put all these together and it makes it hundreds of thousands of dimensions and they squash it down to one, um, one artificial dimension and one artificial number. That means I could take, based on that general training, the word London, and that would have a value associated with it. I would subtract, if I subtract the value for the word uh, England and added the value for the word France, I'd get up with a value very close to the value we have for Paris. There's semantic meaning within this numerical system. The problem is that this isn't aligned to your business, this is aligned to just the English language, Wikipedia, wherever the text is based on. If we're able to collect a lot of our business documentation and create our own vectorization on this, suddenly you've got something that's mathematically modelable on how your business views the words it uses and how it works in terms of its own processes and its documentation. Now there's a caveat here again, as we covered before, if these documents are out of date, they are less useful. But that is a, a way towards maybe using documentation as an automated recommender for architecture. And the last one I want to cover today is causal inference. Now, causal inference is effectively trying to take a lot of statistical work beyond simply correlation and trying to find a high probability of causal relationship between two factors, two entities. Uh, they do require a lot of processing power, and more importantly, they do require an awful lot of semantic relationship network linking to begin with. But it means that once you have stream data coming in, if you've got temporal questions uh, or queries about your business, suddenly with better complete semantic next, you get much, much, much more accurate causal inference in your experiments. Um, I won't dive into it too much. Effectively, you, you look at timings of events, um, effectively not just event streams, but any uh, date time records. And you look at variations in patterns here, there and everywhere and try and see where they confuse each other. This is something that will be incredibly important in probably the next five to six years as the next wave of data analysis. Well, just drawing this to a close, what's the point? Um, the only things I really, really, really want you to take away is ontology work can be really nerdy. You can go away and you can buy um, vendor tools or deep dive into things like Protégé and understand the theory. And that will serve you really, really well. But you can also do it just with a whiteboard and post-it notes and some kind of graph plotter. There's no tool to learn here. It's just talking to your users using sticky notes, pens, cameras. That's a fantastic place to start. If you do this and prove that it works, then have a look at your vendors, have a look at more technical terminology. 
there's many, many tools out there that do this kind of work and even some data vault specific ones. Even your most arbitrary semantic diagrams, none of these were weighted, none of these were tested. We were draw, just drawing lines on whiteboards, but they have meaning. From that, we're able to abstract meaningful architect, data architecture um, patterns and meaningful exploration. And the last one, and the most important one is, no matter what you do, the reason this works is because we're actually talking to our users, really talking to our users. You know, and the reason why often you're going in to fix source system data vaults is because they weren't. Simply as that. The reason why you talk to users is because the last team clearly didn't. Uh, we're closing up a little bit early. I think that gives us about 20 or so minutes for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>